Distilled is a production of Chemical Processing. Chemical Processing focuses on serving engineers, designing and operating plants in the chemical industry. Welcome to the Solution Spotlight edition of our Chemical Processing Distilled podcast. Solution Spotlight, delving deeper into a topic from an industry perspective. Many chemical companies are striving to improve the reliability of vacuum systems, lower total cost of ownership, and meet regulatory requirements for emission standards and noise reduction. I'm Tracy Purdom, Senior Digital Editor with Chemical Processing, and today I'm chatting with Bush Vacuum Solutions' Dr. Jason Steele, Chemical and Pharmaceutical Sales Manager, about the benefits and challenges of dry vacuum pumps. Well, thanks for joining me today, Jason. I'm happy to be here, Tracy. I love talking with people about vacuum, vacuum technologies, and working with people to come up with creative solutions. It's honestly my favorite part of the job. Well, I'm looking forward to our conversation, and we have a lot of ground to cover, so let's get right to it. What are the advantages and limitations of a dry vacuum pump? Well, um, dry vacuum pumps are pretty versatile, and you can you can manipulate them to do almost anything you, you want to do. And there's several technologies out there uh, for dry pumps. And for the most of this conversation, I'll probably just focus on screw pumps because I believe that's one of the better technologies out there. Uh, there's, uh, and especially in the industrial large scale, which is what I focus on. Uh, I mean, there's small scroll pumps and things like that, uh, but they're not uh, applicable to dry applications. Uh, so, uh, the advantage of dry pump is there's it's non-contacting, um, so that means uh, that you won't have any parts that will wear down, like uh, oil, like oil sealed pumps usually have a vein or something that contacts the sidewalls that eventually wears down. So that's a maintenance thing you're going to have to do, which leads to labor costs. Um, there is a small amount of oil, and that's only for lubrication. So the necessary amount of oil that you need on hand is very low and the service that's required for dry pumps is, uh, you know, for our pump it's once a year as an oil change, which is process dependent, but um, for an oil sealed pump or uh, you know, other fluid sealed pumps it could be monthly, weekly. So it, it can save a lot of money on that regard. Um, you have very consistent performance. You have the same performance on day one as you do on day 100 just because you don't have any um, fluid or anything to for the vapors that are coming in to get uh, captured in, and then you either have to expel them through gas ballast or heating up the pump. Uh, they just pass right through the pump, so that's that's also an advantage, and it's non-contacting, so you don't have to. The wear usually causes lost performance. There's no wear, and you don't have anything for that vapors to be caught into. So it's it uh, you have a nice consistent performance which is crucial for a lot of applications. Um, and because it's dry um, and there's no oil, the, the vapors, if you're working with harsh vapors, they'll pass through the pump. So now um, if you have an oil or a fluid that captures these liquids or these harmful gases like HCL, um, uh, strong acids and um, other m- materials, they get, they get captured in that fluid and then you're going to have you're going to have to discard that fluid later, and so there you have some additional environmental issues that you have to deal with um, and waste management. For a dry pump, either you've caught it beforehand using some type of filter, or you uh, send it through the pump and send it to a flare, and then it's oxidized later. So it's it's there's less to, to deal with, and so you can save significantly on some of those costs. Other um, benefits of especially the screw pump is it's a very simple mechanism. Um, there's only two rotating pieces of equipment inside inside of, a, of that vacuum pump. And so the maintenance repairs are lower because there's not a, a, a lot of things that need to be removed, uh, a lot of parts. The vibrations are much lower uh, because they're, they're in a linear fashion, so they're, they're not rotating and vibrating very harshly. And that can be important for vapor deposition or machines or apparatus that can have vibrations down the pipeline. They cover a wide range of uh, pressures. They can get much lower in vacuum range than, we'll say, a liquid ring pump. So that's an advantage. Um, They can handle liquid and powder very easily. 
Now they can't take very large slugs, but they can take a, a, a fluid stream or a dust of powder without too much uh, of an issue. And they're quieter than some of the oil uh, pump uh, alternatives. So those are some of the, the big advantages of the dry pump. And then some of the limitations is, you know, um, every pump is good for certain applications. And while a dry pump is good for a wide range of things, if you're trying to, if you're, sometimes the cost isn't justified. So if you can get away, if you're in the higher range, let's say above 100 torr, you know, sometimes, and you're dealing with a very moist vapor stream, um, it's, it's, it's better to do a liquid ring pump that can, it's a low cost. Again, non, those are non-contacting. They work very well. So um, those are, the, that's, a, that's an instance where, you know, dry pump is not the ideal choice. Um, sometimes when you're working with pyrophoric materials, sometimes it's good um, if you don't have the proper setup to capture uh, these metals, pyrophoric metals that can come through the pump. If you don't have anything to catch it, oil can help. Oil will help protect the, the user sometimes because if whatever metal powder uh, that makes it into the pump is going to be coated in oil, so it's not going to ignite, say, if you open the pump up or something. So now those, those things can be worked around with different traps, um, but it's, it's, it's an inherent advantage that sometimes the oil sealed pumps will have. And then, you know, the cost is also the initial cost of a oil sealed or a liquid pump versus a dry pump. I mean, the prices has come down and since uh, about, I think the first dry pump was out. We, we came out the first dry pump in uh, 1991, I believe. And so the price has come down. Now it's only a difference of maybe 20% more for a dry pump, 20 to 30%, and that depends on the technology. It's not as big of a gap, but it is a bigger upfront cost that uh, people will have to justify, and they are justifiable, and we can talk about that. And I just had a couple of clarifications just uh, during that and what you were talking about. Um, you said there mm -hmm. is a little bit of oil in the dry pump for lubrication. Did I hear that correctly? Yes. Yes. So uh, dry pumps, uh, I, uh, they have oil in their gearboxes, but the gearbox are completely isolated from what we call the sweat volume. So the sweat volume is what the, cast, the process gas is going to see inside the machine. So the oil is not in the sweat volume. It is only in the gearboxes, and that is only for lubrication. The lifespan, uh, they, uh, so the, they have minimal maintenance. Uh, typical is three years before uh, a major overhaul, three years of run hours is typical, but that's a process dependent. Very harsh applications are going to need uh, most likely a shorter lifespan, but they can, they can range greatly from uh, just as much as a, a oil seal pump, and they typically last longer um, if maintained properly because they don't have wearing components. It's just you have to change seals out and some of the bearings from time to time but the intervals are much more spread out. So, so the dry pump's um, lifespan is a little bit longer than a, a, a wet vacuum pump or about the same? Um, or? Typically, uh, they, they will be longer, okay. but it's, it might not be significant for certain applications. Right, right. So it's, it's, it's a tough one to really say how much longer it's going to be. But they, they, because they don't have the wear and they don't have, uh, they're not, like harsh chemicals aren't sitting inside of the pump like they would with a, a wet pump because that they're trapped in the oil. Now if you turn the pump off, now the metal and everything is sitting exposed to, if we're dealing with an acid, say that acid is inside the oil and that acid is just eroding the metal while it's sitting in there but not being used where with a dry pump you purge that with nitrogen now there's nothing in there and it's it's perfectly fine how can an engineer justify the cost of a dry vacuum pump like i said the the prices have come down significantly for over the past 30 years or so um and now it's it's really only a 20 30 percent difference but those those costs can be justified through maintenance uh labor hours of maintenance um uh, you would have to get rid of the oil, so waste management, 
utility costs because um, dry pumps can usually rotate at a slower speed. I'll give you an example. We have a customer who wants to save some money on, on just utilities in general, and so we did a cost analysis for them. When they have a, a very efficient uh, single-stage rotary vein pump, um, but uh, how they run it, it's not in demand constantly. So most of the time this pump is in standby, but they need to have them ready to run so um, they leave them running. Uh, you can use a variable frequency driver or VFD to slow these pumps down. So for a, a wet pump, you could slow it down to maybe 40 hertz compared to the 60 hertz when it's initially rotating at, or at least the motor. And then for a uh, dry pump, it can be slowed down, but not significantly, maybe uh, down by 20% or so. So <clears throat> uh, the dry pumps can be slowed down to about a third of the initial speed of the pump, which saves on cost. So for this customer, for just one, one pump package that they were going to run, by slowing it down uh, with our dry technology, we would be able to save them $20,000 a year. Very and so if you can couple that with you know, the oil waste that you have to do, because some, some oil seal pumps have several gallons of oil inside of them, and so if you're doing multiple oil changes, you have over 100 gallons of oil that you need to change a year, potentially more. So just disposing of that and buying that is a cost that will offset over time. So, um, and then utilities, usually you have more uptime and uh, you can remain with your consistent production. So it, it, it can be pretty simple to justify depending on um, different applications Absolutely. and how the customers actually use the equipment. Uh, launching into the next question, when and why is a dry vacuum pump preferable to a wet vacuum pump? So th there's several different applications focusing on the chemical market. The dry pumps can be used in every, st every step of the way. Um, for, for most instances, uh, like distillation, evaporation, degassing, freeze drying, sublimation, and you know, dry pumps are great for processes that you don't want oil backstreaming, which can be a real problem, especially in the medical industry or if your uh, product needs to have needs to be extremely pure. You don't want any of your oil coming from your vacuum pump. It can actually backstream, so it can actually go against the way that you would think the vapors will go. So you, some of your oil can actually make it into your process chamber and be, you know, coat some of your equipment or whatnot or whatever your product that you're making. And that, that could be very bad. So dry pumps, that will never happen. And so, you know, that's an advantage, especially in freeze drying pharmaceuticals um, because they cannot have any contamination of, of any sort. And so dry pumps really excel in that. And then, um, you know, different... Uh, harsh processes. So, you'd say you're re you're removing some acid vapor that's coming off your process. That acid vapor can get into your oil, which is typically used because they needed a deeper vacuum level. So there's an oil seal pump, and then that acid is going to get into the oil, or whatever compound is going to get into the oil, and then it could cause the oil to fail prematurely. It can cause the oil to rubberize, which I've seen before, which is hmm. is is a you, know, you turn into a boat anchor at that point. And so, you know, it's, it's uh, with the oil seal pumps, that, that can be a very big problem. And the ways to get around that is you have to use Fomblin or a fully fluorinated oil. So Fomblin's a name brand. But, uh, and that's, that oil is close to, I think it's 50 times as much as regular hydrocarbon oil. So um, it's extremely expensive. And so that cost can be justified uh, very quickly uh, because you'll make it up om almost every time after the first oil change, maybe the second oil change. So it's it's a that one's a pretty easy uh, pretty easy cost savings right there. And when you need to get a lower pressure, so like I said earlier, liquid rings uh, like water liquid rings they work well for applications that are high pressure, high volume of fluid coming through. But when you're trying to get to a lower va vacuum or lower pressure typically seen in evaporation and depending on what you're uh, distilling uh, you need a, a deeper vacuum and dry pumps will do a great job of that plus you don't have to worry about 
the small contaminants that come through, make it through your traps and everything, those will pass through the dry pump pretty easily. And you have flexibility, you have more flexibility with dry technology. Say you're running a, a certain batch uh, and you need to slowly ramp up the speed, you can go, you can take a dry pump from the low end speed and slowly ramp it up so you don't have just, um, you don't have any disturbances inside your vacuum chamber. So if you have a very powdery material and you need to dry it, sometimes if you throw the switch, uh, for lack of better words, and all of a sudden you pull a large volume of air, there's a lot of turbulence that generate inside the chamber, and then you, all that will flow into the pump, in which you don't want at all. So you can slowly ramp up the speed on the dry vacuum pump, and then that will keep it from causing a big turbulence jump inside chambers. So, is there any, so. um, I, I just have a quick, and forgive my ignorance, but is there any um, issues with environments that are explosive environments? Obviously, you're dealing with powders in there, but um, you had mentioned with the oil um, being able to coat some of the materials and you wouldn't have an igni mm. a ignition source. Is there any issue with that in an explosive in environment? No. Uh, I mean, you can make um, you can make these drive. Well, you can make them class one, dev one. You can make them, depending on where uh, you are in the country, you can, we can meet those specs of explosion proof. Uh, explosion proof ratings um, in the U.S., we really focus on the electrical ratings because in vacuum, uh, if you consider the three-part triangle for a fire, you need heat, oxygen, and fuel. And by eliminating one of those, typically oxygen, since we're at a low pressure, um, we don't have the concerns about uh, internal combustion. And so the, you won't have an ignition. It's more when you're cleaning stuff out. So sometimes people don't follow the recommendations. They don't have the proper filter upstream. Um, and there can be buildup of this pyrophoric material maybe in the exhaust portion of the line because what goes into a dry pump comes out of a dry pump. Uh, and so they don't take the proper um, uh, steps to protect the pump. So you need a filter of some kind in the front to filter the materials and depending on the size you would have to use different micron levels which is still recommended for an oil sealed pump. Uh, so it's it's not unique. It's just a little bit more crucial that you pay attention to make sure you catch as much and then you do some, usually you do a passivation so you allow them that that material to either ignite slowly so it's easier to manage instead of a sudden burst. But um, dry pumps, while they do run a little warmer than liquid sealed or oil sealed pumps, they can, they, they can certainly fit in explosion proof environments. And because they're a little warmer internally, they, they prevent condensation of the different vapors that are coming through, which is an advantage. So as long as you keep it in the vapor phase, you can pass it through the dry pump and then send it to your flare down the line. Moving on, what factors are more important when using a dry vacuum pump than a wet vacuum pump? The One of the most important things, I would say, uh, for a dry pump is startup and shutdown. In most of the manuals, this startup and shutdown is the same for uh, oil-sealed pumps or wet pumps, but people don't follow it, and it's not as crucial but it is extremely crucial in dry pumps. You want to make sure you allow the pump to warm up because you don't, because there's nothing, the oil and the water or whatever you're using your wet pumps is used to create that seal because there is a gap in between your rotor and your stator and that's filled with oil of some sort or a liquid of some sort. And if you don't allow, and for dry pumps, they just have very tight tolerances. Uh, the, so. You have to allow everything to expand and contract at a at an appropriate rate, which um, the pump will be up to speed. It usually takes 10 minutes, and then the pump is ready to go. But you want to make sure that the pump has warmed up sufficiently so um, before you introduced it to any type of process. And then, the, because you could have touchdowns where the metal to metal contact because a portion of the pump heated up differently than the other portion and then you inject process and then you get a, a large load of compression on one half and then that will cause expansion on one half and then not on the other half. So it's, it's crucial to give the pump time to start up and then shut down is the same thing. So when you're doing a shutdown, you want to make sure you follow what the manual recommends for a shutdown because now all those hot metals are starting to contract. So you don't want them to contract. You just, you're, and it's also, if you have process coming through, 
you want to make sure that that process vapor has been passed through the pump because it is, it is sitting straight on the material inside of the inside of the pump in the sweat volume. So you want to make sure you do a good purge of uh, clean, dry air or nitrogen. Typically, nitrogen is the easiest. You do a, a blanket of nitrogen to pass any of the material out of the pump, and then you, you, you allow the pump to cool down at the rate recommended by the manual so that everything contracts and forms properly, and there's nothing sitting inside the pump just eating away at the metal or eroding the metal. So that's, that was, that's one of the key things. Um, you want to make sure that you do have filters in, in front of the pumps because it's, it, you need to protect the pumps while they can take large slugs. I mean, especially in the chemical environment, it's always important for any technology uh, to, have a, to have a knockout pot if you're doing a lot of liquids. Uh, but a dry pump can take a shot of liquid, so a liter or so, if it comes into the pump, it's fine. It, the, the pump will pass the pump, that liquid right through the pump, it's fine. But you don't want to send like 20 gallons down to the pump, it's going to have a hard right. time with that. And then you have to, you have to do several steps to, to clean that out. Uh, and, you know, sometimes a, like a liquid ring pump, it's not going to care. It's just going to adjust it and it's going to be part of it and it, it'll eventually work its way out. But like an oil seal pump, it's going to care. And it, it, but um, it's, it's more crucial that you pay attention to proper setup, having protection in front of the pump to make sure you catch everything. Uh, at least most things, and protect it from, you know, mishaps where someone actually throws the wrong switch or something, which we see constantly. And you want to make sure you get all the gummy material out. What's nice about dry pumps is you can do, you can do a solvent flush. So you can, you, you've been pumping your material through something really gummy. It sticks to a lot of stuff. And then at the end of the day or at the end of the batch, you can uh, isolate the pump, injects, a solvent that will work for the material and clean them off and then you want to do a nice drying cycle afterwards but you can clean it easily while the pump is running but um, you know you follow the recommended manual for that but it's that's a a nice feature that dry pumps can do but it's really shut down cool down um, are important protecting the pump with filters and then make sure you have some power failure um, modes that in case of a power shut off you want the we usually recommend having inlet to the pump very close so you don't have uh, a lot of room for process to sit in. So you almost directly on top of the pump, you want to have an isolation valve that in the case where you lose power, it automatically shuts, and then you have a nitrogen valve that automatically opens to purge the system uh, out of whatever contaminants or vapors might have been gone through the pump. So that's a safety feature that you would be surprised at how many people don't do. Oh, I can but, only imagine. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what you want to do for sure. And then utilities are crucial um, as well. They're they're more crucial than I would say for a, a liquid, uh, a wet pump. You want to make sure you have good water supply uh, because I mean our pumps are more tolerant to that versus some of our competitors. We have a lo a big water jacket around the pump. We have um, heat exchangers, so we have indirect cooling as an option, and we also have air cooling. So some of these those those three combined is unique to our Cobra dry screw pump versus some of the competition. So it's not as crucial for ours, but it's still recommended. You want to have good water, uh, water coming to the, to the pump. I've had people who supply lake water and the pumps get filled up with mud. That's not, mm. No one's going to be able to survive that one, but oh, it, it's, it's important to have good water and then you want to have nitrogen or some type of clean air because uh, that is what protects your pump. That is part of the almost every dry pump that I know of has some type of purge that goes along the shaft seal to kind of prevent material from going into the gearboxes. Are there any other special design considerations? Uh, not necessarily unique to dry pumps versus uh, wet pumps. I mean, it's still you, you don't want these at the bottom of a run. You want them somewhat elevated. You want to have the, you want to eliminate as much pipe work as necessary. Uh, you want to, you know, because that's just you don't want to lose conductance loss through bends and long pipe runs and and things along those lines. Um, and then you want to make sure your exhaust is clean and clear um, because dry pumps, in general, don't like having too much back pressure. I mean, vacuum pumps, 
all don't like a lot of back, uh, back pressure, but dry pumps, if you have a, if you exceed a, a high back pressure, what can happen is now that air is getting compressed and it's going to become super heated and then you can get some hot spots in the back half of the compression screw. I mean, ours are, ours are more tolerant on it. Typically, the industry average, I'd say, is around uh, 2 PSI. Ours is a little higher. Ours is at 3 PSI, which doesn't sound that significant, but most people sit around the 1.5, and 2, and so we have, we have some room to give, especially with people who are trying to push their process to a flare, and the flare needs some additional, mm-hmm. uh, does provide some back pressure. So uh, our, our pump can help with that or at least is more tolerant to your flare that a lot of the chemical plants have. And uh, the last question is, I know there's myriad choices out there, and you've touched on some of, of the ways to discern how to decide on a proper uh, pump, but can you give us any more advice on how to, how to decide? Well, it's, there's so many different applications, and, you know, it, it's, it's tough to say, you know, what is, is there an easy way? I mean, what I would always recommend is talking to a vacuum expert like myself or someone, or Bush. We have a lot of experience. We've been doing this for over 50 years. Uh, and we know, and we can always give options. We can give you option A, option B, and we'll give you reasons why. Because uh, we're, uh, we're not in the industry to just throw products at things and have them stick and see what happens. We, we want to we want to be part of the solution for a lot of people and a lot of customers because we we're a family company. We want to we want to be part of the family that you that each customer is, and so we want to have everyone grow. Um, so it, it really is going to range, and we can give places where this pump won't work or that pump will, and it's a sliding diagram. And there's a lot of literature out there, and we supply some simple charts. It's like, hey, if you're wanting to be in this pressure range. These are the options that you have. And then as you start going down, well, I'm going to have these type of vapors. I'm going to have this. I hope this. I don't want backstreaming. Uh, backstreaming is not an issue to me. Noise is not an issue to me. Then I want to go this route because with the EPA, a lot of people are trying to get quieter inside their plants. And mm-hmm. so there's been, that's been a big driver for um, dry pumps is um, the, the noise level. It's good to know what you're trying to achieve and then, you, we can help check off the list of different products or different different uh, devices that will that will fit the need the best because everything like tr- like these screw pumps they'll do almost anything you really want them to do but it's not always the best cost or it's the best tool for the application it will work and if you really want to go down that route we can optimize it because we are an engineering group as well to fit and work very well but you know there's always there's always two options most of the time that we can really help with and so uh, you know it's important to talk which a lot of people are afraid to talk to people nowadays it seems like but talk with the vacuum experts and see what we have to say and then you know we will come up with a, a good solution for you and work with you to make sure we're offering the right thing you're there as a partner you're not there to, to sell yeah. them I just wanted to add, I mean, that's the benefit of working with a family company. We are a family-owned company. Dr. Bush, who started Bush Vacuum or Bush Vacuum Solutions or Bush LLC, however you want to throw it, um, he's still part of Bush. His house is on the factory grounds. It is very involved. The family is very involved, and it is a family atmosphere, and we try to extend that, that family feel to our customers and be a helping hand and be a holding hand to help them through all these applications. And what happens a lot of times, uh, I may have forgot to mention, when you're doing a dry pump conversion, there's things that people ignored and they didn't express to us while they're, you know, while we're changing things and getting things ready. And then there, there might be a hiccup or two. Uh, you know, some we wanted to do some optimization. We needed to do that. You guys, we weren't informed. Let's try to operate this in a better manner, and then we can change it. That's all part of changing and converting from a liquid to a dry pump because there is going to be a little bit of hand-holding and getting most people off because it is a relatively new technology, and we're there to help every step of the way, to, to be a helping hand, to help the customer understand what they have in front of them and how to protect and get the most out of their investment. 
Well, Jason, I appreciate your time and expertise. You've certainly given our listeners a master class in dry vacuum pumps. On behalf of Chemical Processing and today's guest, Dr. Jason Steele from Bush Vacuum Solutions, this is Solution Spotlight. Mm-hmm.